Hi guys and welcome back to the Bird Photography Show with Glenn Bartley. Hey everybody. And me, Jan Wigener. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I know I've been jealous looking at Jan's recent adventures out in the outback somewhere in Australia photographing all these cool birds. My friend picked me up in his car. It's like a ute with a slide on camper. So we stayed in that. So he picked me up in Brisbane. We drove all the way to Mount Isa through a few other places like Opleton. There's some special bird there. So we tried to get that then to Mount Isa, then to another place where we found another few special birds and then thousand something kilometers down that Birdsville track and then south from there and then back to Birdsville and then 2000 kilometers back home. Now, did you say the place was called Birdsville? Yeah, it's Birdsville. Well, that's a good start. I was really excited about this trip because basically I had never visited any of these areas. So there was a lot of new birds. There's a lot of grass wrens, for instance, these tiny little birds that are pretty secretive and quite hard to get. I love a good road trip. Something about when you have more time, a little bit more, you know, leisurely approach, you can make stops along the way. If it doesn't work out the first day or the weather's no good, you can spend a second day, you can modify your agenda accordingly. There's something really nice about that. You know, the road trips that I've done, like for example, in Canada, it's it, in some ways it's similar. It's a huge country, big driving distances, but usually you're not that far from a small town or something. So what was it like where you were, Jan? So it depends. The first sort of thousand kilometers, it's not too remote, but then it sort of starts to get quite remote where there would be a town like every 200 miles or every two, 300 kilometers. Mount Isa, I mean, it's a proper city. It's like a big mining town. It's actually quite strange. Like you're driving okay. through this beautiful habitat, like beautiful mountains full of spinifex. And suddenly you see like two monstrous chimneys and then you know you're quite close to the city. What were your what were your like main targets on this trip? There was two parrots I'd never photographed, the varied lorikeet. It's a quite small but really colorful lorikeet and I thought that would be a very hard bird to find, but we actually got quite lucky with that one. And the other one was this subspecies of the Australian ringneck, the Cloncurry ringneck, like a really nice bird, but that turned out to be very hard to photograph, but that was kind of the main birds I really wanted to get. And then there's a few of these little grass wrens in the area as well, the Carpenterian grass wren and the Kakadun grass wren that are pretty hard to get. Most of the areas are now restricted access, so we had permission to go into certain sites and we found a couple other sites, so we got pretty lucky with all of them. <laughs> what were some of the challenges that you faced when you were out there in the field? There's just no clouds at this time of the year. So in the whole 14 days we were gone, we did not see a single piece of tiny little clouds. So you're always wow. challenged for time and the conditions. Our worst nightmare. Totally. Basically, you have an hour and a half, two hours in the morning. That yeah. was definitely challenging. So you always have to either find shade to be able to shoot in a bit longer or make sure you're perfectly aligned sort of with the sun behind you. The other problem throughout the whole trip, heat haze, open areas, 30 plus degrees. Maybe some people haven't gone on a big road trip like this or maybe have never been to, you know, obviously potentially not the outback in Australia. So why don't you kind of describe like an average day in the field? You know, you, you've, you've driven a few thousand kilometers. You're off in the middle of nowhere. You wake up in the morning, go. So usually we would drive somewhere during the day. So whenever we actually had like a shooting session or good light, we would actually be right on location because we really didn't want to waste any good time with the short amount of light that we had. It's amazing when you're somewhere where you can literally just roll up and you're camping and you can just sleep in your car or tent or camper or whatever. Yeah. And you know that in the morning you're literally going to wake up <laughs> and walk you know, 100 meters to your shooting. That's the best. Because we had a bit of extra time, we started to look for some other birds to get on the way home, like a chestnut-breasted quail thrush, for instance. And we thought, oh, we're driving past this town. We could probably have an extra stop. And then you go on eBird, Facebook, you look around, you find some spots, you actually check them out. You find a bird and you get some more shots. Now, must thank one viewer of the bird photography show as well here who helped us tremendously in finding some of these grass and So thanks a lot for that. But even then, nature still loves to mess with you because one of the carpentarian grass runs, like we found the perfect habitat. That was sort of the middle of the day. We found a bird right there within like two minutes. We're like, okay, we're going to come back in the afternoon. Everything's going to be great. Go there in the afternoon, no bird to be seen. The sun sets, suddenly the bird's there. Take a few <laughs> shots thinking, oh, we go back in the morning, we get some killer shots, go back in the morning, no bird to be seen. So <laughs> sometimes I don't know what what's going on. It's like they just like to mess with you at times as well. You can't win them all. You always, you're always going to have ones like that where you miss them. But it's also a lesson in 
once you see an opportunity, you take it. You don't say, yeah. I'm going to go back tomorrow. I'm going to go back in two days. Even if the light's a bit challenging, for instance, or it's getting a bit dark, you just bump up your eyes oh, and still take some shots. And that's part of the reason I only got some of the shots because I just kept shooting. I'm like, the birds here, I'm here. I'm not going to just not do anything. And then that was some of the only shots I got. I, to be honest, probably pre sometimes prefer in this light situation when the sun's actually gone because I get nice and even totally. light after being busted yeah. by the sun all day. So I was actually quite happy that they came out at that time. So. Yeah, you have a window there where it's still bright enough to shoot and you've got, but then it's like tick, 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 tick. And you're like, no, no, stay up, stay up, stay up. <laughs> yeah. I got 20 minutes here to work or something like that. Now you mentioned something there and I think you, you had sent me a message while you were on your trip saying you're hand holding a lot. So what's up with that? Why were you hand holding so much on this trip? <laughs> me as a big hand holding hater, basically hand held the whole trip. It's just the nature of the birds as well. We were doing these quail thrushes. They just run through the scrubs, jump up on a tree, go low, go high. These little grass rents that jump on this rock, then they're on the ground, they jump on a branch, they jump on another rock. So, and it's also quite sort of rocky, steep terrain. The only thing I noticed as well, when you're doing a lot of handholding, I shot much higher eyes always just to have higher shutter speeds. Cause I noticed if I shoot the shutter speeds I'd use on a trial, but like a 400th of a second or something at 840 or 1200 millimeters, that gives you a lot more sort of blurry shots compared to tripod. So I tried to stay at like 800th or 1,000th of a second if I could, which gave me better results. Now, another thing you had uh, mentioned to me, something about 60,000 photos. So is that accurate? That's about what you took on this trip? It's about what I took. I mean, we had some crazy days. I think on average it was like 4,000 photos a day, but we would probably nail two to three new species every session. So we were yeah, very yeah. successful and then... If it's like a good session, a thousand photos per bird, sort of, it's not out of the totally. question, basically. No. The biggest day was 11,000 images, but basically in the morning we went to a spot, there was these awesome little painted finches. Then we went to a park that had the lorikeets and the uh, ringnecks, and that lorikeet nest you could actually, ironically, the best time to shoot it was in the middle of the day because another big tree would put shade on the nest. Hmm. The only strange thing is then to get enough shutter speeds because the shadows are really dark in the middle of the day. You think yeah. 12 o'clock during the day, it'd be really bright. You'd use very low ISO, but I had to use 3200 ISO to get a 500th of a second as my shutter speed to get the scene well exposed. So he took a lot of images there. And then in the evening, we went to look for these Calcadoon grass friends, got them as well, and then went back to the park and got some more ringnecks. So that was a big day. That was like 11,300 photos in one day. That was probably my biggest day ever. But it's definitely a challenge once you come home. I know on the road trip, you always go through all the images every day. You delete them on the road. I don't do that at all. I usually just back them up. And how I do it on the road trip is I keep all the images on my memory cards. And then I download another set onto some SSD drive. So I have two copies at all times. And if I had to reformat some memory cards, then I would probably have another SSD drive with me to have a second copy. Because I think on a big trip like this, we take so many shots of so many rare birds, you really don't want to lose any of them. I know a lot of you guys are quite interested in how Glenn and I go through so many images. Whenever I posted a story about 60,000 photos, I got so many messages, people saying, oh my God, I can't even work through two or 300 photos. How do you work through 60,000 photos? And I think there's a few sort of key things you have to follow. First of all, I think you have to use a program that shows you the photos really fast and also shows you the 100% preview really fast. So that can be Photo Mechanic for Mac. I know you use Breeze Browser on Windows and on other program on Windows that's free, that's really fast as well, would be fast on Image Viewer. And so I open up all these files in that program and it loads really fast, really quick. And then I just tag whichever image I want to keep. And I look at some at 100%. I don't look at all images at 100%. Usually if I know there is a good one I want to keep, I make sure that it's sharp as well. Otherwise, I just really quickly click through all the images whenever I want to keep one, I tag it. And then at the end, I hide all the tagged images, select all the untagged images and delete them. And I think mm -hmm. the key here as well is that you know what you're sort of looking for, what's a good bird post, what's a mm -hmm. good bird image, or you feel like, with a little bit of tweaking, I could get something really good out of this image. So you have to learn yep. how to identify 
the potential keepers and the real keepers. So to sum it up, if you want to go quickly through a large amount of images, you have to know what you're looking for. You need to use a fast program and then you need to be willing to make decisions as well. I think you have to say, this is a good one. This is a bad one. The bad ones all go. And then it's a manageable task. It can still be annoying, but manageable. What were your top three photos, or it doesn't have to necessarily be the best photos, but your top three like exciting moments, exciting photos from this trip? Number three. I think there's a few. We might actually have to group them together so I can sneak a couple more in. It's definitely for me, I only ever photographed one of the grass wrens before, and I was able to photograph four new species on oh, this wow. trip. And this is pretty hard bird, so that was very successful for me right at the beginning one of our first stops was in Opleton there's the Opleton grass wren and we found a pair pretty quickly didn't get the best shots in the afternoon but then the next morning we got some really nice shots of like a pair on the termite mount so that was definitely one of the highlights and right next to that basically we almost stepped on them was also a few Rufus crown emu wrens which were super frustrating birds they actually live in these big spinifex clusters and then they just sort of climb up on these little grass stems. But the challenge with them is obviously there's always at least two or three grass stems right in front of them. So you take like thousands of photos and you might have two or three with a clear shot if you're lucky. So that was definitely a challenging bird, but a fun bird to get. The luckiest one was probably the varied lorikeet. I really wanted to photograph them, obviously, because they're parrot, but I thought they would be pretty hard to get because usually they just feed on these really tall flowering eucalyptus trees. But then we got quite lucky. We actually got to the city called Cloncurry and the vibes just didn't feel right. I just didn't feel like I would get any birds. So I'm like, let's keep driving somewhere else. So we found another free camping site and we're driving down there. There's this little gully with all these flowering eucalyptus trees and there's suddenly like a hundred of these lorikeets. And because you are up on a hill, you're almost at eye level with some of the trees. And so we got some really nice shots there of the lorikeets feeding on those trees. So that was definitely another highlight for me getting a pretty sort of tricky species at eye level. Like there's lots of shots where you kind of look up against the sky where they're feeding on the flowers, but getting them sort of at eye level, that was great. You know, that is like a really special moment where, you know, you, you were expecting them somewhere and then they were somewhere else. And you realize how special it was that you had that opportunity to get them at eye level and you just happened to find the right spot. The birds were there, the light was good and you were able to get some shots. So that's an awesome one for number two. So what was your number one special moment from this trip, Jan? This would be a hard one. Uh, this one moment that was really great because it was a bird I didn't really expect to get was the painted finch, this crazy looking little finch with a bright red face, black and white dots on the body, like pretty cool. I didn't think there would be an opportunity to get it at all. But then my friend is, oh, I could just take you to this water hole. I'm sure they're there. And we just stand at these rocks and they'll land in front of you. I'm like, yeah, sure. And so we go there in the afternoon when the light was terrible. Fair enough. We stand there. Boop, boop, boop. All these finches suddenly pop up right in front of me, like four or five meters away from us. I'm like, oh my God. But it was one of those situations you just couldn't shoot in that sort of light. So I had to go back to the camper, wait till the next morning. And that was one of those sort of nail biters. You're like, are they really going to come back? Is it really going to work out like that again? And so we set up in the morning there, this time with the tripod, because we're kind of hanging off the cliff a little bit. But there's all these nice big rocks in front of us. And these painted finches love these rocks and they stage on them before they go down to the water. And then first there was nothing. And then suddenly, bang, a pair right on top of the rock, both making a nice pose, looking at me in some beautiful light with a nice background. I'm like, oh, that worked out pretty well. So that was definitely one of the highlights. There's many more highlights, but that was definitely one of them. And this image is also a good example why I love using my pro sets because with the Adobe colors, the reds of the bird just didn't look quite right and the overall image looked a little bit muddy. Whereas once I put the right pro set on, the colors improved dramatically and it helped me to tweak the image to get it to the perfect starting point. And once I opened the image in Photoshop, I had to do a few more tweaks that I teach you in my masterclass to get it to the perfect final image. In particular, I worked on a female. She had that one sort of big puffy area that I shrunk a little bit with the liquefier. I stretched it out a bit. And I also worked on that bright spot on the female chest that had a lot of color cast and looked a little bit too bright. And 
did a few more tweaks, few more curves, few more selective color layers, and then balance out the overall image. And I got to the final image that I like quite a lot. And if you want to learn all about image editing and how to make those tweaks and get the perfect colors, make sure to check out my masterclass and pro sets down there in the description. Well, yeah, those little painted finches look super cool. And I can totally understand why that would be your number one moment because it was unexpected. And sometimes that's the one that really jumps out. So we look forward to seeing more photos as you process them up on your Instagram page. And maybe we'll talk a bit more about some other stuff in future episodes. Yeah. But I think for now, it's time to stop talking about Jan's photos and start talking about your <laughs> photos. It's time for the photo of the week. All right, so my first image this week is by Birds by KSW, who I think has been featured in the photo of the week before, and it's of this Atlantic puffin. Now, normally we don't really want stuff between us and the bird. You were talking about your your emu wren, where, or yeah, it was the emu wren, I think you were saying, where yeah. there's all these little things in the way. But yeah. some sometimes you can kind of use stuff between you and the subject in a creative way. Maybe it's sort of like a, a shape that you're peering through and then the bird's kind of almost that spotlight effect. And I thought that this was kind of effective here, using this sort of out of focus foreground, kind of colorful foreground, this sort of dark background and the bird kind of popping up above the cliff. So what do you think of it, Jan? I really like it. I think the only thing that's slightly off here is the proportion of the foreground to the bird. I could see this working with a bit of a tighter crop because I feel like that flowering bush is so much larger than the puffin in the photo. And clearly the puffin is meant to be the main subject of this photo. So I wonder yeah, if that's a good point. A slightly tighter crop, maybe cropping out that dark green bit in that flower. I think it would make mm -hmm. it a more strong portrait overall potentially. But other than that, it looks really great. It also works quite well with the yellow, the colors in the puffin, and then kind of that dark background as well. So very nice image of all. All right, the first image I brought is by Amadou of this beautiful red start. And I just like the colors in this photo. I like the sort of complementary background to the bird and it's a complementary color, but it doesn't distract from the bird because it's different enough that it's not kind of merging in. And I just liked all the colors in the bird, the black and the white and the bright orange, of course. And what would you say, Glenn, I might not like so much about this image? <laughs> Well, I've been looking at it here and there's a couple of things that jump out to me. So I'm not crazy about the perch. I don't know this bird or this behavior. I'm not, it's not terrible. Like it's got a few little things going on. I notice that in the bottom right of the image, there's sort of some, I don't know, like artifacts or stuff. So I don't know if mm. it's like either a huge crop or there was something cloned out of there or maybe just some more effective noise removal, running it through sort of DxO Pure or something or like that. But Instagram algorithm. <laughs> also possible. Yeah, totally. It's always hard to judge. <laughs> um, so those are the things that jumped out to me. I don't know where you were going to yeah. go with your nitpicking this on this image. I think that's fine. I think the main thing for me was also the perch. And I think here's a neat little trick for everyone. What you can do in these situations, if you have a perch that is somewhat brownish color, doesn't look the best, pull out all the color out of this perch, make it look gray and darker. And it will suddenly look like a much cooler image because now the perch also matches the gray color of the bird and the whole image will look cleaner as well. So that's something I quite often do even on the image you see behind me there as well. It's like sometimes there's a lot of light on the perch or the perch has a bit of dirt on it. If you actually remove the color from the perch, it can make it a much more striking image. And I think that would really help in this case. Yeah, that's a pretty cool tip, Jan. And you guys, if you want some more cool tips of how to edit your photos, be sure to check out my eBooks and Jan's Masterclass. They are full of great tips and they will really help you to make your images shine and get the absolute most of them. And of course, if you want to transform your raw files with just one click, also check out our pro sets. Okay, so for my second image, I've got this little guy. I have no idea what bird this is. Jan, do you know <laughs> what species this is? I'm not quite sure. I assume it's somewhere from Asia, I would say, but that's Asian, where it for sure. stops for me as well. All right. Well, then we'll play a fun game. If you guys know what bird this is, let us know down in the comments. Or if you just want to make up a name for this bird, feel free to write that in the comments. <laughs> Either way, I like this shot because I get the sense that this image or this species, it has this sort of purple little, you know, kind of half collar or whatever you want to call it, cheek. And I get the sense that this is the type of bird that doesn't show that color all the time. 
And so I think this pose, while not a normally ideal pose, was maybe key for showing that part of the color of this bird, sort of showing the iridescence on the head and everything. I just thought it was a cool species, uh, this image by Kin Al Fong. I thought it was a cool bird and uh, a neat shot, so that's why I picked it. I definitely find the pose challenging. It's not exactly what I would be looking for in terms of a sort of perfect pose, but you might be right that that's the best way to sort of show the colors of the bird. But even then, I'd usually like to see a little bit more of the shape of the bird. Okay, the second image I brought is by Fish Chris and his image of a blue grosbeak singing on a sunflower. And I thought it was just beautiful colors, beautiful bird, a nice pose. And the bird's just enough in the right angle, even though the sun kind of coming from the right, that it's still lighting up enough of the bird. There's no really bad shadow on the belly of the bird. So that worked out quite well. And I think it was just overall a very nice to look at photo. Definitely. It's a species I, I always see it in the North American field guide. I've never seen one. And I really, it's one I really want to photograph someday. These blue gross beaks. The only thing I might say here is I'm not, I feel like it's, if anything, it's definitely too far to the left edge of the frame. It needs to be moved back in the frame and maybe up a bit higher. A little bit, like yeah. I, I, yeah, I feel like there's way too much negative space behind the bird. It's not, this is an, an example of a composition that's really not balanced. So thinking about that, you know, think about where that center line is. Vertical shots tend to, can be closer to the center line, but I definitely don't think it should be left of the center line. So I would, I would pull the bird back when I was, when I would crop this image, but that's it. Otherwise, I think it's a really nice shot. Maybe it's a little warm, the white balance, tone that down a touch, but overall a really nice shot. Because I think here he tried to keep maybe that leaf in, on the back of the bird, mm -hmm. but he sacrificed all the nice that. yellow paddles. So I think it would be yeah. nicer to have more of the flower, ignore the leaf, almost put the tail to the edge of the frame and a little bit higher and just make totally. it a more balanced composition yeah. for sure. Yep. All right, so for my final image this week, it's of this beautiful Indian paradise flycatcher by Bashir Nidin. I've seen a lot of images like this. I don't know these species at all, but it seems like they nest really out in the open there's always these nest shots and they're super out in the open and it presents some amazing photo opportunities this is a spectacular flycatcher with that long tail and that crest and you know beautiful natural mm. history moment hopefully you know the, you know everything was sort of natural here and um you know this kind of situation where you do have to be a bit sensitive and you know not yeah. linger around the nest or anything like that but if they some birds nest out in the open like think about like american robins they nest all over the place under your eaves troughs everywhere in your shrubs and some birds are just less <laughs> less worried about you know, and it's actually and like there's some monarchs that are related to these in australia as well and they sometimes just nest completely out in the open with the nest hanging off a tree so it's not completely unusual that they willy wagtails would be another one i think remember in perth in the backyard a friend of ours they had like a little willy wagtail nest right above their pool as well and just yeah, like totally on a branch so you can sometimes get lucky but as you say obviously hopefully everything was above the line here no branches removed or anything and you have to be conscious if you're near a nest and in this case i think you're pretty far away as you can tell by the sort of dissolved background and I think what's interesting in this as well, usually when you see these, the composition never works because the tail is well too long on these yeah. birds. Whereas in this case, it actually works quite well and they got quite lucky with how the whole shot worked out. So pretty cool. Yeah. All right, Jan, what's your final image this week? So the last image I brought is of this female Maganza with her babies. And I thought it's a, quite a nice image, but challenged in a few aspects i think we just talked about the composition in the blue growth speak how you should put it all the way to the edge of the frame whereas in this case i feel like we've almost put it too far to the edge of the frame because i feel mm. like a little bit more space or a slightly more centered composition could have actually worked fairly well in this photo simply because of the shape of the rock and just all the birds sitting there. I know the female is looking to the side, so you want a bit more space on the right, but I feel like a little bit more space overall would have been good. And I would have probably tried to just tone down the water ever so slightly as well, but overall quite a cute moment with all the babies stretching their wings. These shots when there's a, uh, babies in it are always challenging, right? Because ideally you'd want, you know, 
them all not stacked up in front of each other, them all looking at you, but it never happens. I was photographing these yeah. Southern screamers in Brazil. They only had two or three chicks, I can't remember, but it was like, God, trying to get a shot where the adults weren't in each other's way and the chicks were kind of looking or not in front of the yeah. bird's leg or anything. So it's tough. And these guys can sometimes have like eight or 10 babies. So here it looks like there was one, two, three, four. They're kind of stacked up on each other, but it's a cool moment. And they're always those kind of cute shots. So it's a, it's a cool thing. Ideally, it'd be wonderful if the water had had more of a blue kind of color. Like if it was, it looks like it was a bit overcast here. Maybe that's a processing thing that you can pull a bit of blue out. But overall, a really cool shot. And with that, I think that's just about it for this episode. We've shared some of Jan's Outback adventures, looked at the photos of the week. We hope you've enjoyed the episode and we'll see you in the next one. Bye guys, and don't forget to subscribe.